So hello there and welcome to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, a show where we take all of the latest news, gossip and events in the world of Formula One and we relay that back to you for your listening or viewing pleasure, depending on which platform you choose to follow on. And sadly, guys, unfortunately, as you can tell from our rather casual and unpatriotic attire that football unfortunately did not come home at least in form of a trophy England coming up so agonizingly close to winning Euro 2020 but alas fallen by the same old foe of a penalty shootout and of course as disappointing as it will be for us and we'll get into that a little bit before we start on the F1 topics got to extend our congratulations to the Italian team who was superb on the night Probably deserved winners when you weigh it all up, although it was really close between the two sides. But um, obviously, we've got to offer our congratulations to them at expense of our own misery. But joining me on this episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, as always, my co-host, Mr. Courtney Pine. Courtney, how are you feeling at the moment? You okay? Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, of course, I'm feeling a little bit flat. Um, I won't get too deep into the uh, events of last night, but I think the thing that's probably made me feel more flat is... The behaviour by some of the fans, you not know, only uh, at Wembley in the streets and online, and it's just I don't know, it's just kind of made the blow a lot harder. Mm. You know, it's just all been right. It's just everything. The whole atmosphere has been quite flat. So, let's make this podcast a good one, so we can lift each other's spirits. Absolutely. And there's plenty more that we can obviously look forward to this weekend being the British Grand Prix. Of course, you're absolutely right, Courtney. Some of the events that followed in the aftermath of that disappointing defeat. Um, it, it just really, it, it kind of showcased some of the real negative, real issues that really still need to be tackled. And by the sounds of it, are, we're still a long way off from actually achieving the desired ca- outcome in equality and diversity, which is a real shame. And I think even if we'd have won Euro 2020 last night, those issues would have still existed and the success would have by no means been a way of overshadowing all of those uh, negative points which still need to be addressed. It's such a shame, but I suppose the best thing we can do is, as as everyone else or majority of people are, and just offer our support to all those that are affected by this, especially to those three individuals, Marcus Rashford, Jadon Sancho and Bakayo Saka, very, very brave young men who have got a huge future ahead of them and will not be defined by what happened last night and will certainly be able to rise above everything else that's gone their way unfairly. So, you know, massive support to them. Um, joining me also on this podcast, once again, a regular with DNF1, it's Lee, who, um, Lee, obviously, first of all, um, a bit of a strange one for you because we're just briefly talking about the Euro 2020 final, but obviously you were travelling home uh, on a plane and obviously by the time you got on your plane, England were winning 1-0 at half time. So it must have been a bit of a strange occurrence for you to come home and realise that um, it didn't go our way in the end. Oh, um, first off, thank you for you both having me again. Um, glad to be here. Secondly, yeah, uh, it was oh, what a, a, a first half, obviously, it come in, but it's like, oh, 1-0. Could, could this football actually come home? Could this actually happen? And that's like, nope, extra time and penalties. Oh, that's just typical England. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to need another song for this one I mean free lines is great but it, it, this one yeah it definitely hurts a bit more than the other ones anyway nonetheless of course let's cheer ourselves up guys by talking about the British Grand Prix coming back this weekend F1 is back after its one week hiatus after the triple header we just had and now we are going to Silverstone and of course there are plenty of talking points going into this weekend of course the George Russell Valtteri Bottas situation at Mercedes which one will it be Courtney and I discussed this in quite a bit of depth at last week's episode but Lee obviously before we go into the British Grand Prix itself we can't ignore this developing story which from what I've been hearing we may get a conclusion of some sort at least some clarity over which one it's going to be by this weekend Um, can you give us your thoughts on how you think this is going to go down do you feel that Mercedes should keep Valtteri on for another season. Do you think they will do that? Or do you think now is the time to give George Russell that opportunity to really show everyone how good he really is in the Mercedes? Um, Firstly, I want to start with Valtteri. He's obviously a very good, solid round driver. Um, There are worse drivers in the grid than Valtteri. I'm not going to mention any names on on, on that. Obviously, people um, have their own preferences and opinions. Um, But I... I think George deserves the chance. I think um, Mercedes have asked themselves, Hamilton's getting older. He may 
uh, walk away in a few years. He may do another, to see out his new ex- uh, contract and then walk away, or he may want another extension. But will Valtteri lead the team and be the champion that they need to replace Lewis? And my feeling is they're probably going to say, no, Valtteri is not that man. We need someone who's got that fire and drive that can handle Charles and Max. And Valtteri, unfortunately, has already proven that he can't handle Max um, and Charles to when uh, obviously Ferrari was better in the previous seasons. Um, where George, obviously, on that one race that we had last year, did prove that he could beat Valtteri. Or it was a one race. You can't make a um, sort of a judge on just one race, but Mercedes have a lot more data than we do. So I think it's going to be George's chance to uh, get to the front of the grid, personally. Mm, you're right. I, and we shouldn't judge George based on that one performance in Sakir. Yeah. The the only caveat to that I can offer, though, um, is that whilst it's, you know, it's, probably ill-advised to judge a driver on one race performance. I remember Alex Albon last season in the Red Bull had a brilliant race in Abu Dhabi, but you couldn't assess his quality over the season or capability of being in that Red Bull alongside Verstappen based off the last race. Uh, Nor would you say that if he'd had 20 excellent races and one or 16 excellent races, I should say, and one poor one, you wouldn't say he had a bad season. Um, But in this case, it really did highlight the qualities that George had. And whilst he's somewhat familiar with the Mercedes car, he was able to jump in there and by most parts, be the dominant driver in that Grand Prix and deserved winner against a driver who was very comfortable, a circuit like Bahrain and Sakir, obviously respectively, and was comfortable in that car. So obviously it was a resounding performance and any sort of indication Mercedes were unsure of that, that or that they needed that George was going to be good enough to be in this car, they very much received on that one occasion. Of course, since then, George has had his ups and downs at Williams this season, but of late, George has really been up in his game. His qualifying performances have been exemplary as always, and, you know, a Q2 performer at minimum. Um, this season and of course got into Q3 in the Austrian Grand Prix and once again so agonisingly close it seems to be the trait with English athletes that we seem to be ever so close but not quite able to take that final step in George's case into the championship points a a lot of people Lee have kind of thrown arguments to say George needs to do more to convince Mercedes that he's ready for this seat Um, realistically is there anything more George can do I mean other than score a championship point, what more can George do to convince him that he's got, that he's ready for this opportunity? Well, firstly, I can't resist the op- opportunity to score two or more championship points. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think he's obviously, um, as Crofty, I think it's Crofty, is Mr. Saturday you know, on Sky F1. Um, obviously, he did get beaten by a voucher to pull in secure. But apart from that one blemish, he's outqualified every teammate he's had, mainly all at Williams. Um, but the, the, the race results and even his race craft, he, right, it seems to be him and uh, Fernando seem to have regular appearances on track together at the moment in the last few races. And that's been the Alpine that's come out ahead of the Williams. Um, but I, I don't think you can expect more from George to consider in the car. But there's a risk. What really proves the driver, if you think back to George Bianchi in that, um, was it Marussia at the time? Yeah. yeah. Um, what he did in that Monaco where he got Marussia's first points. When you get one of those cra- crazy hat races, is the good drivers take advantage of it. And obviously you can't manufacture those kind of races, but that's probably the only thing that George can do is go, when a crazy race happens, go, look, I've got this Williams here. Um so that's really all it you can suggest, but that's uh, just a, an occurrence that is way out of his control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a good point because I, I think one, if we can be picky and make one critique of George at this point in his career, in that he's not always been able to take the opportunity or at least consolidate it when it does present itself. I'm thinking Imola last season when he made that mistake to cause him to crash out whilst in a points paying position in, in the race and probably would have finished there. Um, you know, another race as well in, um, it was Mugello last season where he might've got points there, just missed out when um, Sebastian Vettel managed to hold on in the Ferrari. Um, you know, there's so many chances for George and you'd look at someone like Lando Norris, for example, who 
seems to be taking every opportunity that comes his way at McLaren and is excelling. Obviously, the two of them racing together in juniors for a long time. You obviously want George to be competing alongside Lando, and it's very it's very easy to make that comparison. But um, it, it just seems right now that regardless of what Mercedes do, they're going to have to take a punt on George Russell sooner rather than later. Um, Courtney, I'm going to bring you into this discussion as well. That We're getting more and more people now starting to come to the opinion that it's only a matter of time before George Russell is announced as a Mercedes driver. Um, we've had George Russell on his social medias. Uh, one recently where he was washing his uh, brand new white AMG Mercedes. Obviously, you know, quite nice to have outside your home, one of those sorts of cars, of course, for anybody. But um, it's those cryptic messages we say in taking care of the things that you love. His words, obviously being quite coy in interviews, saying he's going to be driving a Mercedes-powered car next season, no matter what. Um, and some other hints to say that perhaps he knows something that we don't, uh, even as far as cross, uh, Crofty, from Sky F1 on, I think it was Virgin Radio this morning, um, obviously talking about Euro 2020, but promoting the British Grand Prix, he is very confident that we're going to get an announcement soon that George Russell will be confirmed as Hamilton's teammate for 2022. Where do you stand on this? Because I know we talked about this last week, but with the momentum of this story building up, do you feel that we should be expecting an announcement? And if so, Will it be good for Mercedes, regardless of which way they decide to go for the rest of their season? Yeah, I touched on this in the last episode, and I think it's it's good for everyone involved, really. It's good for George, for obvious reasons, so he can prepare for next season, and for Valtteri, so he has more chance to see which options are open to him, so he can get a seat. Um, and also for Mercedes, you know, got massive changes coming next season, and need to have a sense of stability to attack because they are beyond Red Bull at the moment and they do need to have two solid drivers heading in the right direction in order to, you know, be towards the top because it's going to be a, it's going to be very, very difficult for Mercedes to be at the top given the big changes that are coming. Yeah, that's very true. And of course, I think we should expect that regardless of what decision Mercedes decide to make, whether they stick with Bottas for another year or they promote George Russell, it certainly nice I suppose to have that level of closure depending on which direction they go although if they do decide to go down the George Russell route which I'll be honest I'm expecting as well it's going to be a lot of pressure on Valtteri Bottas to continue to deliver if he can um, with the risk obviously that he may decide not to really try as hard and also he has to audition himself for other seats wherever that may be so certainly a lot to play for and perhaps Mercedes probably have assessed this and feel that this is the right time other teams have mentioned that they're keeping an eye on George I think Dr Helmut Marco mentioned that Red Bull are keeping tabs on him as well which um, might really uh, expedite such a decision from Mercedes mm. to try and prevent him from being touted and you know, one over by another team, especially a team like Red Bull, where things are just going so well at the moment for them. Um, but let's move on to the other news, of course. Liberty Media and F1 have announced on Thursday. Bear in mind, guys, we're recording this episode on Monday, so you will get it Wednesday. But obviously, if news changes on any of these topics, obviously, we've recorded on the Monday and we obviously weren't aware of at the time. But um F1 and Liberty Media have announced that they're going to be streaming a live presentation of a model version, a, um, a full-scale replica version of what they expect the 2022 F1 car to look like. Now, this is really, really exciting because, of course, the new rules are coming up. We've known about them for a good few years now, and we've always been given a rough idea what the car was going to look like. We had a scale model, I think one to two scale, that was presented late last season. It's a very basic format with uh, in mind what the rules were going to dictate the cars to look like. Um, and, and now we're going to see a full-scale version, at least what the uh, F1 and Liberty Media hope the car is going to look like. The teams, of course, will have their own ideas, but we're expecting it to be fairly uh, similar to what we're going to see when the teams break cover next season. Um, Lee, are you going to be watching this live stream? And if so, how excited are you to kind of see um, a pretty accurate, I suppose, not necessarily rough version of what this new car is going to look like? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure I'll be watching the live stream personally, um, but I, I know, because I, I think at that time, unfortunately, I already got something that's uh, going to clash with that. But I saw um, a supposedly image a couple of weeks ago from the car. Obviously, so I'm going to be catching up after the, the live stream just to see actually if the opposed, the, the image I had seen is actually genuine. 
<laughs> for mm. a start um, and just compare. But the from at least the leaked image that I had seen, um, the, it does look a much more on an attacking type of car in, in appearance. I don't know if either you two have seen the the previous leaked, supposedly leaked image um, of the, the new car style. Um, the, the closest I can describe it, it's, it looks a lot more indie car in, in how smaller it is and the, the aggressive looking nature of it. Um, but I, I'm look, so looking forward to the, the exam because obviously this year, all apart from Red Bull, all the teams are on hold. So really looking forward to all the hard work the team's putting in and just going, you know, what innovations has someone come up with? Like, so to get an indicator is, yeah, I know it's just a concept car, but still very much looking forward to it. Hmm. And it's going to give us a good indication of what we're going to expect next season, it's at least from an aesthetics point of view. Um, you know, from what we've been briefed on and what we've been told, no one is expecting these cars to be faster than the current ones. I think we're all expecting them to be a good few seconds slower over the course of a lap. The, the cars themselves, yes, they will be smaller, but um, they're still going to be quite heavy. They're not really going to change much in weight, which is a bit disappointing because I think we were hoping for something a bit more nimble. But owing to the constraints that F1 currently faces over its current technology path, and we expect that to continue with the new engines in 2025, however they decide to go, it's going to be very, very hard for F1 to go back to the days where the cars weighed as much as a toaster. And uh, we're pretty much frightening to handle with the talk that they used to give out whenever you put your foot on the throttle. So, you know, at least from a looks wise, they're going to look futuristic looking, I suppose, a little bit more elegant and simpler than the current ones with all of the aero pieces attached to them and all the veins and everything else that you can see on the cars. Very radical, aggressive looking designs. We're going to get something a little bit more um, conservative, I suppose, is a better way of putting it and a bit more sleek than what we're used to. Um, Courtney, I mean, how excited are you to see this new concept car? And do you believe at this point that it's going to provide the desired outcome in terms of racing? Because this is kind of the basis of what F1 wants to achieve with this um, new concept in terms of better racing, uh, a more competitive grid, almost like a reset. Um, do you think it's going to deliver on that? Well, of course, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think we've had some interest in this championship runnings in the Turbo Hybrid era, probably not as many as most fans are hoping for. So a revamp is needed, certainly. And in terms of the Formula One spectacle, I suppose the biggest drawback has been caused by the amount of dirty air the car in front lets off, which um, obviously makes it difficult for cars to overtake. So they're hoping with these aerodynamic changes we'll be able to see more overtaking. I hope it happens. I suppose we won't know. We won't know until then, until next season, how they get on. But at the same time, with the innovations that this team create with the with the aerodynamics, there's always a chance that they could still create unstable there. So we won't really know until, well, probably mid-season if we continue to see that desired effect. But let's hope that, that we do get a little bit more of uh, a overtaken in what we've been seeing in recent years yeah i can i can see in the um chat actually while we're doing while you're while you were talking courtney lee kindly sent me over a link over to one of the leaks that um he was referring to it's very similar to one that we posted on the socials not long ago i think it's from live gp italia uh their mm -hmm. online page and you're right lee I, i'm expecting a car to look very similar to that when it was leaked a little while ago and given the reputation of some leaks that we saw um during the launches i think earlier this season i think the one that really shocked me the most was the leaked image of the ferrari with the green mission winnow logo which obviously we all thought surely it can't be right because why would ferrari have a green mission winnow logo and then of course have and behold we saw it gasped with shock and amazement that it was accurate so I wouldn't be surprised if it was very similar to that or at least uh, an early stage of that. But um, as I said, the car looks all right from what we saw on the leaked image, but uh, we'll have to wait and see what they have in store for us. But I imagine it's going to be very similar to the uh, 1.2 scale version that they showed us late last season, obviously a bit more refined and obviously some a nicer paint job, I suppose, uh, something striking to get the fans appetites watering for next season. But uh, speaking of which, of course, let's move on to the British Grand Prix now. And 
I suppose we can't really get away from the change in format this weekend. Of course, we spoke about it quite a few times this season in anticipation of it happening. We're finally going to see our first F1 sprint race. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with how this is all going to work, I'm going to briefly just explain the new revised format for a sprint race weekend, and it goes as following. So on Friday, we're going to have our first practice session as normal, FP1. Then late Friday afternoon, we are going to be having the qualifying session for the Saturday sprint race. And this takes place in the same format as qualifying normally does. So you have Q1, Q2, Q3. I'm not 100% sure if the rule on starting the race on your Q2 tyres is going to continue. I'm guessing because there's no mandatory pit stop for the race, that probably won't be the case. Um, so just normal qualifying without that little caveat in there. Then, of course, on Saturday, we're going to be having uh, the second practice session in the morning um, as there's only going to be two practice sessions this weekend as a result of the sprint race being added to the weekend. And then we have the Saturday sprint race, of course, which will be a third race distance, about just over 100 kilometres. No mandatory pit stops. Doesn't mean to say we won't see any, especially at a track like Silverstone, where tyre wear is quite high. And the results of the sprint race will determine the grid for the main race on Sunday. So nothing really changes in terms of the Sunday race. The grid will just be determined by the results of the sprint race. And of course, the top three finishers in the sprint race will receive points. First gets three points, second with two points and third with one point. Now, there's been a lot of debate over what do you credit the winner of the sprint race? Do you credit them with a race win or do you credit them with like a de facto one third race win just for the case of the statisticians? Um, well, it seems that F1 have thought about that. They've decided that they're going to award the race winner with just pole position for the main race. So that's the pretty much the short summarized version of how the weekend format is going to take place. So Obviously, if you're still confused, definitely check out F1's website. They'll be able to explain in a bit more brief and detail, but that's how it's all going to unfold. Um, Lee, I'm going to come to you first on this one. Are you looking forward to the first F1 sprint race? And do you think it's going to deliver the desired outcome, which is to create, um, add a little bit of complexity to the race weekend, a bit more randomness, but also a more exciting racing to the weekend format rather than just having free practice sessions? Uh, um, personally, in, in concept, I I was saying I've touched on previously when I've come on. I don't think it's needed, but in regards to actually the first sprint race, I'm interested to see how it happens and what play, how it plays out. And um, it's so obviously going to go two ways. It's going to be a boring event, just a big long train because no one wants to risk any damage or anything like that. Or it's because it's the first race. There's going to be teams confusion. Drivers don't know what to do. Thing, uh, they obviously drivers know how to drive a car, but because it's just a whole new situation that they're not used to, especially as more experienced Formula One drivers who haven't been in the lower categories where they haven't had raced a sprint race for many years. It, it could throw a curveball for the more experienced drivers compared to the younger drivers who obviously come up from Formula Two in the, the last couple of years who've done sprint races more recently. So there is the the, the opportunity for chaos, as I would put it. But uh, just the, interested in just the concept to see how it goes, really, more than anything. Yeah, and I suppose when you highlight the risk, the biggest risk of all is that if you suffer an issue in sprint race qualifying, or the sprint race, I suppose, um, the punishment is a poor starting position on the mm. Sunday. And, and Courtney, I suppose the question we all have to ask on this one is, how great is the risk? to a championship protagonist like Max Verstappen or Lewis Hamilton, when in their minds, obviously, whilst they're expected to be finishing in the top three positions of the sprint race, and obviously, therefore, subsequently getting at the front of the grid for Sunday, there are always going to be those behind that might try to chance their arm in a shorter format and may decide to put the car on the line a lot more than the latter two will. Uh, go back to the whole topic, I was... I was against the sprint races at the start of the season because we thought at the time it was going to get a tight championship battle. That doesn't seem to be the case now. So I do think it will give us a little bit more sort of excitement for the weekend. And the reason why I raised that is because I think where there is a bit of a gap now between Lewis and Max, I don't think there is as much pressure, particularly on Max. So it might make the racing a little bit more interesting because I think Lewis would be... So if Lewis and Max are close in the sprint race. I think Lewis will go for it, given the situation. He knows he can't afford to lose any more points. 
So I think because, ironically, because the championship battle at the very top has become boring, it could actually make the sprint race a lot more interesting than it maybe could have been in a situation at the start of the season where it was close between a pair of them. No, that's a good point. And I'm sort of thinking along the lines of, is there, I mean, is there a real incentive um, for a team, say McLaren or Ferrari, for example, the two teams most likely to upset the balance of the front two in this sort of situation? Is there really an incentive for them to try and go for it and beat them in a sprint race when there's only three points available or at least maximum to one of their team's five points on offer? Or do you feel that... Mm. They'd be better off just trying to not risk it and just get a good starting position for the next race. Because the real battle, I think, in this sprint race that we probably could all agree on is going to be in the midfield to see who's going to start, let's say, fifth place um, rather than starting in 12th or 13th. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Ferrari in particular because I think there will be a team that will go for it in the sprint race because they have stronger race pace. They, they, do, they do tend to... Well, the race pace has been hit and miss, but if you have a look at the teams that have better race pace, this format is a real opportunity for them. So if Ferrari, for example, have stronger race pace than qualifying pace, then this is a big opportunity for them to get a good haul of points on a Sunday. So again, it does it does mix things up. So if you look at George Russell, we spoke about George Russell, it will probably be against this format because there's going to be more racing and the race pace isn't as good in the Williams. So it's an opportunity for some teams that previously wouldn't have had an opportunity in the um, traditional format. Hmm. And that's a really good point. I, I think it's worth pointing out that there will be some drivers that won't be fans of this because they were obviously preferred to start in a good grid position owing to their performance in qualifying over one lap rather than having to do it over 20 or so laps and maintain that position in the race. Of course, we will still have the qualifying on Friday, but obviously it's a lot less significant than it used to be. And I think we can all agree that 20 or so laps is more than enough time for a driver that's got a poor qualifying position to kind of get that back as long as they manage to get through the field quickly. Um, I'm thinking perhaps Sergio Perez might be one of the drivers that might benefit from this more than others if he's not able to nail it in qualifying. Mm. Although he has been getting better, I must admit that. Um, Final question before we move on to the main race itself. I'm going to ask you both this. One, whilst F1 is trying to be open-minded about trying to bring in new ideas to make the weekend more exciting, should they really be focusing on improving qualifying as the big selling point? And two, whilst the sprint race idea is sound and is very useful in the junior categories, will this work or do you see this working in F1? Um, Lee, I'm going to ask you this one first. All right. On the, the regards to innovation, um, within a, in a sport, obviously, Formula One is aware of its target audience that it needs newer, younger viewers. Most of the fan base are more of the older population. Um, and they, are, they, they they seem to think that younger viewers, maybe even people younger than us, not that I consider ourselves old, but uh, they may be more aiming for the, the actual well, teenagers um, or younger and short attention span. So having that kind of innovation and trying it up, I can see the logic behind it. But as a sport, you can't you can't stay stagnant. You have to you do have to think, especially in a sport that's supposed to be the, the pinnacle of motorsport. Mm. It has there has to be some level of innovation, even in the, the rules and stuff. Things could change, new ideas. So I'm not against it, but I think the the race should probably be more the the target than the actual qualifying because as, as I said before in previous episodes the current qualifying format seems to work there's no problem with that um, change, change practice or reduce practice give handicaps more in practice so I, don't, I don't know there's, there's probably loads of other options that even fans other fans out there around the world can uh, suggest varying different things um, and in, in regards to the, the, the second touch on is yeah I it's, I'm not sure it's going to fully work, but as I previously mentioned, it's it's worth watching and seeing if it's going to be interesting or not. Although one point I do want to add, um, slightly off topic with your question, is uh, currently the Friday practice session is now qualifying in the UK. Obviously, we're we're still currently working from home, apart from Courtney, um, where we can uh, watch the the Friday practice session, um, but. It, post-COVID, or I say in another two weeks, um, 
where you have potential return to the office and you'll miss the, that Friday qualifying. That's a good point. Yeah. So, yeah. And a regular fan base, how you, you're going to maybe be missing a, a, an important part of the weekend. No, that's, that's true. That's a point. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, I mean, we should point out, obviously, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, is lifting pretty much all restrictions on COVID in the UK for the time being from the 19th of July. Uh, I think the British Grand Prix has been given a pass, obviously, uh, as it's just before that for the occasion to allow all fans to come in. So, yeah, there will be some fans, obviously, that are working from home that will get to enjoy a practice, as they've often done. Um, obviously, not the same for others that are still working in the office or work wherever it is that they do work. So there's always that to consider with this. Um, but Courtney, Lee made a good point, in addition to the other questions about free practice, obviously, again, being a bit of a moot point for the weekend. It, it's been a bit more exciting than it used to be, purely because it served as a good indicator for who is wearing qualifying and because it's condensed, um, that it's made it a bit more interesting. In addition to what we've, you know, just asked on sprint races, do you think that they will work? Um, do you feel that perhaps F1 needs to look at avenues where they can try and make practice a bit more exciting or worth more? Or do you feel that perhaps less practice is a better way to go? Uh, to answer the first question, I think the two uh, main topics we've raised uh, regarding uh, the 2022 regulations and the sprint races, I actually think they're codependent on each other. The sprint races are more likely to work if the 2022 regulations have the desired effect where we get more overtaken. Because you're running a risk. So with this format, with, with these current regulations, we are more likely to see a train. We're more likely to see a procession rather than a race, given the, the, the length of time that we have. Because most of the overtakes that we see in, in these regulations are down to strategy rather than on track. So that's a slight concern I have for this race. But if the regulations have the desired effect, sprint races are more likely to work. That's how I feel on it, to be honest. No, that's that's fair. I mean, yeah. I'm kind of akin to borrowing um, a little bit what we do in F2 and F3, whereas you have your qualifying session. I mean, you can have qualifying as normal on the Saturday afternoon, if you like, or whenever or in the morning, if you want to make it a little bit earlier. Um, and, and that determines the grid order for Sunday's race. And then obviously you have the sprint race perhaps after that, um, just for the sake of, you know, if teams have damage in the sprint race, they won't miss qualifying. But, you know, for a sprint race to happen independently of that, and of course they can come up with a new way to determine the grid for that. Perhaps, um, you know, the top 10 finishers from the previous race obviously starts 10th to 1st, and then everyone else, you know, starts behind them. A similar way to how they do in the F2 races, something like that, because I just feel that whilst the sprint race there is a logic to it and given how it works in the other series obviously it's worth trying I just feel that qualifying in the format that we currently have throughout this turbo hybrid era has proven to be one of the highlights and, and that's not because the format is brilliant although I think we can all agree it's a very good one certainly one of the best qualifying formats we've ever had in F1 but it's more down to the fact that because people it's the only time of the weekend where you see the cars at full throttle and the drivers at their, at, you know, the cars at their lightest where the drivers are really able to have a good go in it and show the fans what they can do. But because of the lack of overtaking, because of these new cars, sometimes qualifying does provide the excitement by co comparison to a race which doesn't necessarily deliver much excitement. So I still feel there are tweaks need to be made. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I don't think that this sprint race is a good idea for Formula One because I feel like it devalues Sunday race a little bit and qualifying in the format that we have. But if there is scope to make this work, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to kind of borrow what F2 and F3 do and, you know, perhaps determine the sprint race grid by a reverse order of some sorts, not necessarily a full grid reverse order, but something like that. And then just have qualifying for the Sunday race. Um, but let us know what you think, guys, obviously, with the spring race. Are you looking forward to it? Do you think it's going to work? And do you think it's really going to have much impact on the F1 weekend as a whole? As I said, we're only trialing it for three races this season to see how it works. Um, I imagine F1 are going to set this up to try and be as successful as possible, but let's wait and see how it goes. Now, let's move on to the main event of the weekend, Sunday's British Grand Prix. A very exciting one for a lot of reasons. One we've already mentioned, four capacity crowds this weekend, over 300,000 people are going to be flocking to the grandstands over the course of the weekend. Certainly wish I was one of them and could be there. Otherwise, other commitments have had to prevent me from doing that this year. But nonetheless, guys, 
Let's start with the huge, huge talking point at the front of the field, the championship battle between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton. And Lee, as I said, I've asked Courtney plenty of times this so far this season, but is this British Grand Prix now the critical moment in the season where Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton in particular need to find a way to beat Max Verstappen and gain some momentum in the second half of this championship? Yeah, short answer, yes. Yes, it is. Um, they, we're already, is it 10 races in um, this weekend? Um, yeah. Just off the top of my head. Um, so, all right, we're, we're in, a, in an unknown 23 race um, season if they replace a final replacement for Australia. Um, but it's getting to mid season, coming up to the summer break, and Red Bull are now on a, the biggest streak they've had in the turbo hybrid era. Um, and the biggest losing streak for Mercedes in the, the time uh, in this era. So Mercedes need to stop that momentum that Max is building, or even Red Bull's building, because of the constructors alone, and um, not just the drivers' championship. So obviously, for a long time, Toto's going, "Oh, we're not going to upgrade the car," and then all of a sudden, they're saying, "We've got a big upgrade coming for Silverstone." Um, obviously, I think Toto's probably over exaggerating, and I think it was. Um, last race weekend where he said, oh, we're going to talk about upgrade and we'll be two or three tenths faster than everybody and everyone will be blown away. That's probably an exaggeration. But if the upgrade works as much as Mercedes think it will be and it closes the, the gap up to Red Bull, that like we had at the beginning of the season where they were equal machinery, then at least we get an exciting uh, few races, especially coming after, this, after the summer break where Red Bull will have to wind down its... Uh, investment in this year's car because it still needs to focus more on next year as the season goes on and as fans we all want that close championship battle um we don't want them one team getting ahead of the other um so it is really much make and break uh, at least how, how i see it yeah and it's a it's a good point you made on the upgrades because i think this is something that's been talked about a lot in the last week or so since the conclusion of the austrian grand prix Mercedes obviously bringing the final round of upgrades for this 2021 car. Um, all of their leading uh, technical directors uh, or you know technical personnel like James Allison and Andrew Shovlin, they've already mentioned that these upgrades, they don't expect it to be a huge leap in performance. I think it's going to be a lot of little pieces that they're going to bring to this car that's going to make it significantly better. But it seems that the plan a for them is going to continue in which they will just try to understand this car as best as they can in the same way that red bull seem to have obviously maximized the potential of theirs to try and get to a point where they can compete with red bull on a regular basis and not be blown away by them as they have been done in the last couple of races but um courtney on the topic of the battle between red bull and mercedes the obvious figure that can't be ignored this season is how impressive Max Verstappen has been in a position where he has the best car. He's been driving fantastically this season, hasn't finished outside the top two in a race in which he has finished. Um, even if Mercedes can provide Lewis Hamilton with a car that can at the very least compete with Max Verstappen, is Max Verstappen driving at the level right now where only the best version of Lewis Hamilton in a Mercedes can beat him? I still think at this stage, I still think Lewis can catch him. I think you're right. You raise a very good point. This weekend could well be vital. Um, Max is one DNF away from uh, Lewis being on par with him again. You know, we I think Baku was a perfect example. Max is comfortable and then he's tire blue. And we know how cruel Formula One can be. So Lewis just needs to have a couple of solid races in order to stay close to Max. And it all comes down. It's, it's, it's might sound a bit dramatic, but I think this whole season really, really does depend on how well these upgrades work. Massive pressure on Mercedes this weekend. Could well be. And of course, as we already alluded to, the uh, George Russell talking point could be a huge factor mentally in the Mercedes garage, mostly to Valtteri Bottas in the Mercedes as well. And, you know, we've often talked about the battle between the number two drivers, Perez and Bottas. There haven't been too many occasions where those two have actually come together this season. Although, in fairness, in recent races, they've had their battles. They had that battle in the French Grand Prix, Perez getting the best of Bottas. And at the Styrian Grand Prix, it was a role reversal where Bottas was the better of the two drivers on the day. Um, 
where do you see the battle going on between these two this weekend? Um, Lee, I'll come to you first. Do you think Perez is going to have the advantage or do you think we're going to see uh, Valtteri Bottas doing the job for Mercedes? I got I, mean, I, th- I think for Valtteri, it really determines what does happen within the Mercedes camp this weekend. For example, we said earlier in this episode, if the George news does happen, right? Valtteri is a professional, but any driver who's going to who's in one of the top teams gets kicked out. It's going to be demotivated. It's going to take an um, emotional hit, and it will take a while to reset and come back by and to prove that he's still a caliber driver. So if that does happen, I personally wouldn't be surprised if you have a very demotivated Valtteri um, that disappears. But on the other hand, Valtteri may have already known this for a few races, which is might be explaining some of his previous performances earlier in the season where. Where's Valtteri? Um, and especially as there's rumours circulating that Perez is going to get an extension to his contract. Um, he's on a high at the moment, proving wrong um, Gasly and Albon that you can take a, a second driver to Max. So it, it's really, I think, it's obviously down to their mental state. One driver is on a high and one's potentially going to be on a low or on a way of a low. Um, so I would say Perez is probably going to be the... Uh, the better driver coming in, into this weekend. That's a good point. And, and Courtney, how do you see this battle going? Because it seems that, you know, Lee raised a really good point about Bottas's contract situation. Will he or won't he be at Mercedes next season? If we do get an answer to that question, it could potentially have a huge ramification mm-hmm. on Mercedes and Bottas's season where it could either make Valtteri more defiant and in turn benefit Mercedes in terms of the Constructors' Championship. But on the flip side, it could demotivate him completely to the point where he's completely nowhere and he's straggling in the midfield with the likes of Ferrari and McLaren and perhaps even further those behind him as he has done in the odd race this season. By contrast, we seem to have Perez at Red Bull, who's by his own admission, has had a tough time to start with, but has really picked up his performances. He got that win in Baku and, you know, that, that podium at the French Grand Prix. And since then, He's been able to put himself in a very strong position and it's made the job easier for Red Bull to manage both of their drivers. Um, how do you see this all unfolding, assuming that Valtteri Bottas is told, if he hasn't already been, that George Russell will be replacing him next season? I think at this stage, it's very much advantage Sergio Perez. Um, really, for the two points that you two have raised, first of all, obviously the situation with Valtteri Bottas and also a good point that you raised earlier, about the format, the format will benefit Sergio Perez. So you put those two things together, I'll be very surprised if Sergio Perez doesn't get the better of Bottas this weekend. And do you see either of those two making a case to try and potentially win this Grand Prix this weekend? Or do you feel that at the very least, one of them could try to upset the uh, the number one driver from the rivaling team rather than the number one in their own? I think they're up against a Max Verstappen that's, in his element, I think it's going to take a lot to beat Max and a highly, a highly motivated Lewis Hamilton, knowing that one, he has to deliver this weekend, and two, he does generally take it to the next level in front of the Silverstone crowd. So I think the top boys are going to be difficult to beat this weekend. That's a good point. Um, let's move on to the next battle, the best of the rest, McLaren versus Ferrari. Um, Lee, it seemed at the start of the season, McLaren had a slight advantage over Ferrari. And then, of course, we went to the more nimble, slower speed tracks like um, Monaco, for example. And of course, we had Baku, where it has those traits that suited the Ferrari well. And it seemed that Ferrari was making headway, not just in qualifying, but being able to convert that at the race as well. Um, In the last couple of weeks, we've seen a huge uprise, even more impressive than what we saw at the start of the season of Lando Norris in the McLaren. Um, and whilst Ferrari are doing OK, I think we can all agree that this at the moment they're looking second best in McLaren in when you weigh everything up. This weekend, a track which probably might suit McLaren a bit better than Ferrari. Are you expecting McLaren and Lando Norris in particular to have a strong weekend? Or do you feel Ferrari still have something up their sleeve in which they could probably counter punch them? And more importantly, get a result at their home circuit like uh, their counterparts did last night against our beloved England? <laughs> um, well, I, I think it was touched on earlier, um, or Courtney touched on earlier with Ferrari, um, with the, the new um, sprint race 
McLaren is one of those teams that seems to have a better race pace than qualifying pace. Although Lando's had some very good qualifying so far this season, um, generally the car seems to be better in the race trim, um, at least compared to the midfield. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Lando's one of those drivers that's going to take full advantage of the sprint race. Well, I, I don't expect him to be a winner of the sprint race and on pole, although personally I wouldn't complain if that does happen, because what a race that would be on Sunday if that does happen, um, although very unlikely. The I think McLaren will be in good form. I think the real question, though, for McLaren is, again, Daniel Ricciardo, obviously a driver of Daniel's calibre. Uh, it's not very nice questioning it, but the same with Sebastian in the past, where we're Sebastian for Ferrari, but you've seen he's come to Aston Martin and he's found himself again. So, so I think the real question is, will Daniel find his performance this weekend and take it to McLaren? Because it's if Ferrari have a good weekend, Lando can't hold it on his own against two very good um, Ferrari drivers. No, that's good. That's true. And I think qualifying in the last couple of races for Lando Norris has been a bit of a marvel in that regard. Very nearly getting pole position. It was only half a tenth off of Max Verstappen. So in a weird way, whilst obviously he'll still be going for it in Friday qualifying, it's not really going to be worth as much as it would have potentially been if we were going under the standard format for Sunday's race. But still, I'm sure in front of a home crowd, you know, the home team McLaren as well with Lando Norris driving as brilliantly as he is, it's certainly going to be one to watch out for this weekend. Um, Courtney, on the subject of McLaren and Ferrari, of course, we've already mentioned how brilliant Lando has been this season, probably the driver of the season so far, in my opinion, Uh, the only driver to score in all nine races this season. It's very, very easy to overlook what is going on on the other side of the McLaren garage in Daniel Ricciardo, but Daniel had a very good performance at the Austrian Grand Prix. Very unlucky not to finish ahead of Carlos Sainz, who eventually got him in the Ferrari owing to some great tactical uh, strategy in the moment by Ferrari, it must be said. But Daniel himself has admitted that he has uh, now considered using a home simulator, similar to the ones that Lando Norris uses, Max Verstappen, George Russell, Charles Leclerc, because he obviously feels that there's some level of tangible benefit Mm. that he can receive from that, even though it's not necessarily something he prefers to do. He prefers to be more active and outdoorsy on the weekend. Living in Australia, that's not a surprise. But how do you see this weekend going for Daniel Ricciardo? And in addition to that, how critical is he going to be to McLaren in trying to win the battle with Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship? Well, he needs to be strong in races like this where McLaren are expected to have the advantage. That, that's that's the way it goes. Obviously, if you have the better car, you want to be getting maximum points that you can. But I, I said this before, I, I, I think Daniel's struggles are sort of looking worse than they actually are because of just how well Lando Norris is doing. I think Lando Norris, is, is, is ta- he's gone to the next level this season and it's just made life harder for Daniel Ricciardo coming into a new team because it does usually take time for these drivers to settle. Of course he struggled, like that's that's obvious. But I just think Lando's form has made it look even worse. And in terms of him turning it around, I think he showed he's, he showed signs in the last two, three races that he is doing that. So if he just carries on the way he's going, I think he'll be fine. But fine isn't enough because of how well Lando is doing. Now, that's a good point. And Lee, I can see you sort of nodding your head quite a bit at that point. I, I'm guessing you sort of share those thoughts that Courtney has mentioned, considering that Daniel's performances may be looking worse than they actually are because of how good his teammate has been. Yeah, I completely agree. It's just crossed my mind of um, what if uh, Carlos Sainz hadn't gone to Ferrari, how would the two be doing this year? Uh, that's that's just a, an interesting what if scenario. Um, would we say saying, oh, Carlos, what's happened to Carlos? Well, where, where's he gone? Because they were very level next year. So it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very good point that I hadn't uh, thought of. So I, I completely agree. No, that's true. And um, I suppose on the subject of Ferrari, before we move on to the next phase of the pecking order, um, I'm going to be quite brief with this one. Um, for obviously, Ferrari have had a okay season I think the target has always been to finish in the top three it's still a very realistic target but it has fallen a little bit to the wayside owing to how impressive McLaren and in particular Lando Norris has been and of course Ricardo as well to that degree um I'm going to ask you both 
if you can think of one area that Ferrari need to improve on for the rest of the season, it can be any part of the team or even the drivers themselves. What would you say that would be for them to beat McLaren? One thing you can think of. Um, Courtney, I'll ask you that one first. I'm going to take the obvious one that every single Formula One fan knows, and it's straight line speed. They're still struggling from the uh, from the controversy they were involved with a couple of seasons ago. They do actually seem to have a solid car. They seem to, well, they've made a big step forward from last season. Let's not forget where they were last season. They've made some big strides forward, but they probably have the they probably have the worst engine at this stage. So, of course, that's that's probably where they're really missing. You know the performance. I've, I've, they'd probably hope that this whole season would take a place on street circuits. They'd be just fine if that was the case. But that's that's the obvious thing that's missing with Ferrari this season. Hmm. And if it was Formula E, Courtney, as you pointed out, Ferrari would be very much fancying their chances, yeah. <laughs> given the way that those circuits are laid out. Um, Lee, same question to you. If there's one thing at Ferrari that you think needs improving, and and bear in mind, Courtney raised a good point, but I would say let's think realistically what Ferrari can actually improve on their car, or n- not necessarily the car, anything in particular. What would you think that would be? Well, it, the thought that comes to my mind is similar to what Courtney said, but it is the drag which obviously affects the straight line speed as well. Um, they, they last year, one of their big problems, obviously, apart from down horsepower, was it's a very draggy car. And I still think, fundamentally, that Ferrari is a very draggy car. Um, it's, it's very easier said than done, but it's effectively removing drag from that car to give the better top speed and straight line speed. Mm. So it's that holding hands with Courtney's uh, improvement. I think for me, if I could think of one thing, it's probably mitigating or eradicating mistakes that go on over the course of the weekend. Um, And Charles Leclerc is an obvious example, as brilliant as Charles Leclerc has been for Ferrari. Of course, Ferrari have repaid that faith with a huge five year deal. Not even Michael Schumacher received a deal that long. So it shows how much faith they have in Charles and of course how much Charles means to the team. But we're sitting at this point of the season, despite Charles being the, uh, you know, unquestionable number one in this team. And yet Carlos Sainz in his first season for Rose, only two points off Charles Leclerc. And I think you can put that down to a couple of things, but one in particular is the mistakes that have been made, not just from Charles, but the team as well. Um, Austria, I think Ferrari made a bit of a mistake by putting Charles Leclerc on the medium tyres when they put Carlos on the hards and it worked out better for Carlos towards the end. I think if Charles had started on the same tyre, he'd have been just as impressive as he was the week before. And perhaps you know, got a better position, may not necessarily have challenged um, Hamilton towards the end of the race because of what happened to him, but certainly there was an opportunity there lost. And in Charles's case, just needs to cut out those, I suppose, um, laps of concentration, if in the fairest way of putting it, obviously the incident with Gasly at Styria and, um, you know, which cost him a potential chance to battle with Lando Norris, who is going to be the guy that Charles Leclerc has to focus on beating week in, week out. And at the moment, it's not happening. Lando Norris has very much got Charles Leclerc where he wants him um, and that needs to change. So hopefully Ferrari can figure that out and I'm sure we'll see a much improved Charles Leclerc for the rest of the season. Less than mistakes, hopefully, but got to keep the faith in the Ferrari boys. Um, not a popular choice, but it's mine nonetheless. But let's move on to the uh, next part of the midfield. Now, this has kind of been where the exciting battle has been, or at least the most competitive battle between Aston Martin, Alpine and Alpha Tauri. It seems that race by race, we seem to have a different car that seems to be the most competitive out of the three. Um, Lee, who do you think has the edge this weekend out of the three teams? Um, my gut would probably be going more towards Aston Martin this weekend. Um, and that is because before the this year's rule change, Obviously, yeah, the Pink Panthers uh, um, being the, or the Pink Mercedes, I should say, last year. Um, but Silverstone's always been a, in the recent time anyway, a Mercedes is a strong track um, where they just start to dominate. Um, and if we're ex- expecting Mercedes to make or break due to the similar car um, that the Aston Martin has, I would expect them obviously to be one of their strong tr- tracks too. So that's where my my gut is going to be going towards is the Aston Martin battle beating Stroll um, because the battle's come alive now. Um, but yeah, just a, also I would suggest it's just a Fernando Alonso throwing that Alpine around. That's, I'm he's going to have a field day. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going for Aston Martin and they do seem to be making progress in the way that Mercedes have to a degree on their car over the course of this season. Um, Aston Martin, obviously, this is a home track for them. Lots of motivation for them to really try and move up the pecking order. Of course, the shift of mentality is always going to be on 2022. That clearly is the best opportunity for them to try and make the biggest gains up the field for next season. But then you've got two teams at the moment that, unlike Aston Martin, don't seem to have both of their drivers on the same wavelength in terms of their performances. Um, on the one hand, we have Pierre Gasly and Fernando Alonso for AlphaTauri and Alpine, respectively, driving mega quick, putting in some great performances and picking up the points on a regular basis. But on the other side of the garage, we have Yuki Tsunoda, who has made quite a few mistakes, albeit it's his rookie season, so he can be permitted that. But we saw in Austria that two very clumsy lapses of judgment cost him 10 seconds worth of time penalties, which cost him points. And we've got Esteban Ocon, who has really suffered in his performances, not necessarily just the race, but qualifying as well, ever since he signed that new contract. So, Courtney, in addition to what Lee has just mentioned on Aston Martin, do you feel that Alpine and Alpha Tauri will struggle to beat Aston Martin unless they have both their drivers scoring points regularly? Or do you feel that Alonso and Gasly's performances will still be enough to beat them in the constructors? I do think that Pierre Gasly will be, yet again, the star of this midfield battle. You know, we've spoken a lot about how Lando's making the big difference for McLaren. I think we're seeing Pierre Gasly do the exact same thing for um, Alpha Tauri. And I, I do think it will continue. He, Pierre Gasly has found consistency. He's been consistent throughout the season, well, even the past two seasons. So a lot has been said about um, Valtteri Bottas 2.0, but we are seeing Pierre Gasly 2.0 since he's gone back to Alpha Tauri. And I, I think he's taken it to a different level. And yeah, I think he'll make a difference again this weekend. Mm. And he's without doubt been one of the best drivers this season. And in a way, it's almost gone unnoticed because of, the car not necessarily being able to put him up there in at least in race trim with the likes of McLaren and Ferrari, but qualifying, he's clearly been able to drag mm. that car along. Um, Lee, Courtney and I have talked a lot about Gasly, you know, where is he going to end up next season? Will Alpha Tauri still have a seat for him? What other options are available to him beyond this season? How do you see this all playing out for Pierre Gasly? Do you feel he still has a future in Formula One? And if so, where would you feel that would be? I think he definitely has a future in Formula One. He, uh, he does have talent. Um, I think he's looking to get outside the Red Bull family. He's uh, He doesn't want to be an Alpha Tauri. He wants that Red Bull seat. And Marco, um, Marco has made it very clear that he's not getting in that Red Bull. Um, I think it's looking likely, well, I say it looking likely, I think if, if he ever leaves Alpha Tauri, it would be to Alpine, to Ocken's expense. Um, depending how Ocon seasons go, obviously he's still got. Is he is his last year in his contract, Ocon, or has he got another? Well, no, he he signed a new deal recently for another okay. few years. So the Alpine um, door. I didn't know seemed, that, so I missed that one. Yeah, the um, Alpine but, one seems to be shut on him for a while. Uh, I would have still said it was Al, Alpine. Um, it may be on Alonso instead of Ocon. It's depending how Fernando, but I, I think uh, from what I've been uh, reading around, it's very much the, the French team loving to have the two French drivers mm. um, would it be a, no option obviously it's just slightly contradiction to what I just previously, previously said but I wasn't aware of that contract announcement I missed that one um, so I do apologise but yeah it's I, I, if he's going to move to any other team I, I still think it's going to be Alpine um, more than anything yeah, I mean he's certainly a driver that a lot of the bigger teams should be keeping an eye on because he's proven his pace and he's Despite the difficulties he faced at Red Bull, there's certainly something there about him from what we've seen at AlphaTauri that if you put him in the right environment, you nurture him, you look after him, and Franz Toss is one of the best in the business in doing that, you can get the best results out of Pierre Gasly, and it certainly can't be ignored. And hopefully he has a future in the sport. It may present itself in another year with a team and perhaps other seats will become available. Um, Courtney, coming back to the original question I asked Lee on how he saw this weekend going for those three teams. Lee's obviously gone with Aston Martin to have the best weekend out of the three. Where is your mind at? Who do you think is going to have the best weekend out of those three teams? I think I'm going to stick with Alpha Tauri. 
I think I think Gasly could get the Hall of Points and they need just to edge Aston Martin. But it's definitely going to be close. I think I completely agree with Lee. I do think Aston Martin will be stronger this weekend. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I think Alpha Tauri, as you said, Courtney, I think they will have the best weekend. The Honda Power Unit's done wonders this season for both them and Red Bull. And with those reliability upgrades, perhaps it will allow them to go a little bit quicker or run the engines a bit more than they would have done earlier in the season. At a circuit like Silverstone, that can't be ignored. And I think that is going to be um, the Achilles heel for Alpine, in particular with the Renault power unit, obviously not as impressive, but Fernando Alonso certainly will be wringing the neck out of the car as he has been doing the last couple of races. And hopefully for their master Ben Ocon will be able to find something because Alpine do need points in this battle because obviously they haven't had a podium whereas Alpha Tauri and Aston Martin have both had one each at the Baku Grand Prix, which has really put Alpine on the back foot. So we'll have to wait and see how that transpires this weekend. Now, obviously, we're going to go to Alfa Romeo. Just a quick point on them. How do we see their weekend going? Because once again, Lee, um, Alfa Romeo seems to be this proverbial team that finishes either 11th or 12th. They seem to love that position. Of course, we didn't get that last weekend because of Raikkonen's mistake, although he was occupying that position when it happened. Um, Are you expecting anything from Alfa Romeo this weekend? Or do you feel that they're just going to try and pick up a point if they can get lucky or just falter into the midfield? I'm personally not expecting anything from, from them. I think it's they're, they're, or a lot of the teams obviously are focusing next year, but I think they're one of the teams that have just gone, yep, we built our car, let's do next year. Pretty much like how, how Haas and Gunzestano has basically said from the start, we're not going to develop this year's car. We're going to just focus on next year. And I mean, there, there'll be opportunities as they can because they're obviously a bunch of racers and they're just going to turn off the sake of it. But I don't think they're developing as much as like the Williams, for example, is. Um, so they're, they're going to see what they can do, but I'm not expecting any miracles from, from them. Yeah, no, that's true. And, you know, the, the hardest part of Alfa Romeo is as much as I want them to do well, Someone asked me the other day, what is the most exciting thing about Alfa Romeo this season? And I have to say, well, the car looks good. Yeah. And that's yeah, about it. Too. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that is literally <laughs> it. I mean, True. and the saddest part is they don't get much TV coverage until the mm. end of the race. Either Giovinazzi or Raikkonen somehow is in 11th place and no one can fathom out to why that is. But there you go. I mean, Kimi this season has been brilliant at making up places, particularly at the Austrian races. It's just a shame that he made that mistake and taking Vettel out uh, towards the end of it. Um, Williams and Huss, guys, again, this is a battle that hasn't really provided too much excitement. I suppose the only highlights that we could note is on the rare occasion where Mick Schumacher and Nicholas Latifi have a little battle at the back between each other. That seems to be the most excitement either team can muster. Um, on the subject of those two teams, Home race, of course, for Williams, George Russell in particular, a lot on his mind, not necessarily in his own performance in the Williams team, perhaps elsewhere. Are we expecting much from the likes of Latifi and the two Husses this weekend? Or is it just going to be another one of those where we're going to see battles amongst themselves? Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say I think George Russell is going to get his first point to Williams. And I'm going to explain it when we do our actual predictions for the race. So I'm going to keep you waiting on that one. Well, well, well. C- capture my interest, <laughs> Courtney. I can't wait to hear this one. Um, for those of you obviously not watching this on YouTube, my eyebrows went pretty high and surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of George and a big backer. I just think this is going to be a track that won't suit the Williams at all, being yeah. such a high-speed circuit as Silverstone is. As brilliant as George is, I just, I'll be amazed if it happens. But of all places here, but Lee, I've got to get your thoughts on this one. Are you as optimistic as Courtney is, or are you like me just thinking probably going to get the odd moment here or there, but nothing in particular to write home about? Um, I, I don't think it's a car that would suit Williams. I agree with you. Although I am interested in Courtney's, uh, um, why George will get his first point. So I'll look forward to that on the, on the next episode, but it's, I obviously, I think George will get a Q2. He will, yeah, he would he'll muster that. That's that, I think that's pretty standard now for George and that Williams. Um I think he'd be disappointed if it's Q um Q1. Um but between the Williams and the Hass, it's gonna be back of the field, not much happening. Maybe a mass spin spin um 
but he hasn't done that recently, so you can't even say that much anymore. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just going to be a holding pattern, really. They're, they're both teams are like on to next year. Let's just see out the season. I'm expecting something for Mazepin at Maggots and Beckett's. You know, call me a sinister, but I, it just has the ingredients for a Mazepin moment in Friday practice. Although Mick Schumacher does that as well. Mm. Um, yeah, it doesn't work off the, the tongue as well as Mazepin's been. No. No, <laughs> someone's going to have to come up with something clever for Schumacher's, but you know, it doesn't really roll off. Yeah. But it, at least, you know, the one caveat or the one saving grace for Mazepin is at least when he spins, it doesn't come back with a hefty repair bill. Whereas, Mick Schumacher does, although, you know, it's not Mick Schumacher's dad's that's paying for his seat, unlike the other half of the garage. So um, it, there's a bit of irony to that in, you know, in that Mazepin's, the funding from the Mazepin's is obviously going mostly towards Mick Schumacher's repair bills rather than his own son's. But um, I'm sure that's an opinion a lot of you probably have or agree to. That's, you know, make your own mind up on that one. Um, well, this is the part of the show where I would say, let's go to the predictions. Um, before we do, I've been hearing some whispers around Williams over who they're going to be recruiting for next season if George Russell does leave to go to Mercedes. Now, a lot of people have been saying, well, Bottas seems the obvious answer, but it's not always as clear cut of that. I'm also hearing that Latifi's seat might not necessarily be safe either next season, which is a bit of a surprise because Williams... Obviously, as we know, they've gone some financial through some financial hardship over the last few years. Of course, Claire Williams and Sir Frank had to sell their stake in the team and to Doralton Capital in order to keep the business going. And of course, there's huge plans from them to try and take Williams back to the front of the grid, which I think we can all agree is where they belong. Now, Latifi does come with a huge financial back in into the team and you'd think that would keep his seat safe and he's not necessarily driven to a level that you'd say was not good enough but he's not exactly done anything that's really set the headlines like George Russell has so with that in mind guys we could potentially be in a situation where Williams may have two new drivers next season so I want to ask you both who do you realistically think if Williams do have two new drivers next season who they will be and also, who would you like to see in that car next season? So, Lee, I want to ask you that one first. Okay. Well, first off, I just want to add, has Valtteri posted any picture of um, cleaning any Williams-related product? I know they don't do a car, but <laughs> um, I couldn't resist the opportunity. I would have his probably old, said His old helmet. He's just doing his old helmet. <laughs> I mean, it could, could be the old drinking a martini, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as it was akin to one of their sponsors. Of course, there are other alcoholic drinks out there. Yeah, um, but I think Valtteri, if the news happens with Mercedes that we expect, I would imagine if it's just going to be a straight swap back. I'm sure Valtteri does want to go down the grid, but I really don't see any other seats that he could occupy if he wants to remain in the sport. Um, so I wouldn't imagine he's, I imagine he'd be back at Williams. I mean, he certainly wouldn't want to take a reserve seat at Mercedes if it was offered. No, he... He would either walk away from the sport or I imagine it'd be a Williams. I don't see him ending up anywhere else. It'd be a shame if he walks away because he is still a good quality driver, but I, I imagine he'd be at Williams. And in regards to the TV, um, I had heard that uh, as well. Um, and Nico Holkenberg has come up again. The good old He's solid reserve. And our Nico coming back would be great. I was still wanting to get his first point. Um, not no podium, not a point, get it rightly. Um, get his first podium. Not that Williams would get a podium, but he's more likely to get a podium racing than not racing. So I really would like to see a, a Valtteri and, and Nico um, Williams. I think that would be a, a nice combination with the, the new regulations next year. Yeah, that could be an interesting setup. Hmm. That, that does sound like a pretty good uh, lineup. I'm not. I'm going to be honest. I didn't have anyone anywhere near as exciting as that in my mind. So I'm actually liking that one uh, for two re for two reasons. I can't get this image of Valtteri Bottas dressed up like James Bond drinking a dry martini out of my head. Um, I don't think <laughs> Bottas Valtteri Bottas. No, it doesn't. Quite, I mean, it kind no. of it's a bit like James Bond. No. All right. Well, I, don't, I, could, I could see it happening. Just like you know, to who it may concern, sipping a martini, and then the rest is history. Um, we tried to keep this family friendly podcast as best we can. So try not to swear. Um, but it's really wholesome as well. You mentioned Nico Ross, uh, not Nico Rosberg, Nico Hulkenberg. It's infectious. I'm getting it now. Um, because 
I heard the other day on his Insta, I think he's um, expecting, I think his partner's actually um, expecting a baby soon. So I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, that'd be a lovely story. A nice little mini Hulk, perhaps maybe see his dad back in Formula One. And let's be honest, Nico Hulkenberg has been trying to get back into Formula One for so long now, since he was uh, obviously let go a couple of years ago. Um, and he has had his moments last season. He did substitute in a few races and he did relatively well, all things considered. So they certainly could go a lot worse than signing Nico Hulkenberg. Um, Courtney, where, what about you? Who, who would you like to see in the Williams next season? And bear in mind as well, there are other options, say F2, for example. Let's not forget drivers like Jack Aitken, who drove in the Sakir race last season, Dan Tictum doing rather well in the F2 championship. But who would you like to see? in the Williams next season? I'm going to throw a surprise one out there. Alex Albon. I reckon mm. Alex Albon, I think in this stage in his career, I think it'd be wise of him to leave the Red Bull programme. He's not going to get a chance at either um, Alpha Tauri or Red Bull anytime soon. And yes, I know he represents Thailand, but he is dual nationality and he does have that British background as well. We know, let's, let's not forget that he he did drive growing up with the likes of George Russell and Lando Norris. So he's very much in that um, British driving circle and I think that would be a good move for both the team and the driver because Williams could be one of the teams that could be taking a step forward in the future so I think Alex Albon could be a decent move for them. Mm. That's a really good shout actually because you're right you know the dual nationality is there you know he is British as well as a uh, Thai driver um, so that is definitely a good shout actually and I think yeah. You know, also because, you know, the Red Bull program, the way it is, Perez doing really well. It doesn't seem that Albon's going to get the chance at Red Bull anytime soon. And I think we could all agree that if he was back in Formula One next season, it would most likely be at Alpha Tauri. But even then, you've got Sonoda, who's still probably going to be there for a little while. Um, Pierre Gasly, I imagine they'll want to keep him on for at least another year, just in case opportunities open up in the market. I think they'd go. I think Red Bull could do a lot worse then not keeping Gasly on and trying to put someone else in just for the sake of it. Whilst they do have impressive drivers in Jan Deruvala and Liam Lawson doing rather well in F2, I think they would probably prefer to keep what they have. Um, but yeah, I think Alex Albon, given his situation, if an opportunity does present itself at Williams, that could be the opportunity to sort of reinvigorate his career a little bit. And a driver who has got plenty of speed in him, we just didn't really get to see the best of it last season. Despite, just like that. Yeah. One thing to expand on that brilliant idea from Courtney is, if you recall, when Daniel Ricciardo joined Formula One, he wasn't even in a Red Bull team. He was in the... Oh, it's the Spaniard, wasn't it? HRT. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the it. HRT. Jesus, yeah. Um, and that was... Uh, his drive was sponsored by Red Bull. So could you imagine a Red Bull-sponsored drive in a Williams that gets their money cash flow from losing Latifi? If mm. Latifi goes, I should say. And maybe an avenue for Red Bull powertrains to have a customer team in the future, not necessarily in the short term, because, of course, Williams has signed up with Mercedes for a while yet. But that could be interesting. I mean, unlikely because, of course, Williams have expanded that technical partnership with Mercedes from next season that we talked about a while ago. But it's certainly one to ponder. Um, my driver lineup wasn't as exciting i went with bottas and maldonado because for the lulls <laughs> God um my. for the lulls you're you on form today yeah i'm having, i mean to be fair you're the one who's on form Courtney. you're coming up with some absolute brilliant ideas speaking of which let's get into the predictions um i can't wait to hear this george russell for recording how this is going to play out <laughs> um if anyone's followed us for, uh, for a while now obviously this is pretty much as monumental as it gets in terms of a podcast prediction but let's start with the obvious ones um, and because it's the first sprint race I think we should do a prediction not necessarily on the top three but who we think is going to win the sprint race first and then after that we'll do our top three for the main race does that sound okay yeah sounds yeah. good good right so Lee I'm going to come to you first sprint race winner and top three for the main race on Sunday okay well I'll probably say just because I would love to see it happen more than anything. Lando Norris, come on. I would love him to be a spring race winner. Just stick in that McLaren where he shouldn't belong. Um, it's sh shame it's only worth three points though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would love to see it. Not realistically, but that's going to be my prediction. I was going to go out there. Um, but for the actual race, um, I really would like to say Lewis, but I would say Max Lewis Norris. Oh, Lando, go get the get the first names. 
<laughs> it's you still suffering from that jet lag by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, been a maybe. <laughs> but um, yeah, do you know what? That would not be a bad prediction. And I think the funny thing about Lando, if he won the sprint race, and obviously that technically would be his first official pole position, is when you go through the F1 archives and see what does Lando's first pole position lap look like? And you've basically got a clip of Lando doing his final lap of the sprint race rather than the traditional one lap when it's nowhere near as fast and he's coasting or whatever the situation is. It's like, that's not quite what I imagined, but um, still counts all the same. Um, Courtney going to come to you now sprint race winner and top three for the sunday race okay so i'm going to be predictable and go with max to win the sprint race but i do think the sporting gods are going to smile on england supporters on sunday okay they're gonna, they they're gonna, yeah they're gonna they're gonna even they're gonna either gonna we're gonna have the universal balance is going to be shifted once more and we're going to see two two englishmen on the podium and we're going to see George Russell get his first points in Formula One. So I'm going to go Lewis first, Max second, Lando third. And how is George going to get the points on the Sunday? I think that's what we want to know. How is that going to go down, Courtney? There'll probably be a safety car just at the right time. It's just going to leave George Russell. There'll be a safety car of about three laps to go and George Russell being a point. So he'll just go over the line <laughs> on the safety car. And that's, that's how he's going to do it. And the stands are going to go crazy. Yeah, everyone's going to be in unison. There's a big Mexican wave going on. Everyone brings placards with George and Russell spelt out and a big mosaic of his face in the uh, Stowe Corner <laughs> grandstand. I love it. Look, that, that's an image. That is a, forget football's coming home. That's F1 coming home right there. And, and of course, F1 is coming home this weekend. That is, And that's not dependent on us beating Italians in a 90-minute game of football. Um, my prediction for this weekend, probably not as exciting. I'm expecting a Max Verstappen win in the sprint race. And I'm going to go with a clean sweep and say Max is going to win um, the British Grand Prix. It's it's hard at the moment. Of course, we'll have to wait and see what Mercedes upgrades are going to be worth to them, whether they're worth as much as two or three tenths of a second overlap as Toto Wolf uh, claimed at one point. Not sure if he was being serious, but that might be a bit over the top. Um, I think it's going to be very competitive, but What's really impressed me about Red Bull this season is that they've been to quite a huge variety of circuits and they've had to change and adapt their car for every single one of them to maximise their strengths and, and mitigate their weaknesses. And they've done that so well. So this is another track where I think Red Bull are going to run a little bit less downforce at the rear, um, not to get too techy. And it's something that they've done a lot this season to try and stop Hamilton and Mercedes from overtaking them. Uh, when following them and it's worked really well post Spanish Grand Prix uh, and I think they're going to try something similar a second place I'm going to go Lewis and third place I am going to go with Lando Norris I think this is going to be another strong weekend for McLaren and Lando's going to do another fantastic job um, before we wrap this up guys one bold prediction for this weekend doesn't necessarily have to be a result it can be a moment or anything related that you can think of um, Lee what's your bold prediction for the weekend well, I think I've already been bold with Lando winning the sprint race. But if you want another one, ooh, okay. um, let me rack my brain. I hadn't thought of a, a bold prediction. Can you come to, back to me? I'll come back to you. <laughs> Courtney, obviously you went pretty bold as well with That's George it. and P10. But have you got another one for us? I'm sure our listeners are dying to wonder <laughs> what me. else is going round in your head. That's a pin on the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Schumacher second. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> oh, God. Okay, bold prediction for me. I I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe a Ferrari finishes in the top three in the sprint race. Why not? Why not? Why not? Not sure which one, but maybe one of them. But I take it that neither of you have got... Uh, no. Anything on to top what you've already given. Uh, fair well, enough. We already gave our poll predictions, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm greedy. I'm asking for another one. But <laughs> All I would say is Daniel um, gets it together this weekend and the, uh, gets in the, the top three in the sprint race. Fair enough. Okay. Well, one last prediction. Who's finishing P11? Giovinazzi or Raikkonen? <laughs> Gio. He's going he's gonna to be buzzing off the Sunday. Yeah, I would probably agree on that one. 
Yeah, I'm almost expecting a rendition from him on the radio singing Ness and Dorma like Andrea Bocelli did. Probably not as good, but, you know, just as he's going around in practice, just to rub it in a little bit more at our expense. But uh, nevertheless, guys, let us know what you think is going to happen this weekend. Can you give us a bold prediction? Who you think is going to win the sprint race and also who you think is going to come out on top in the British Grand Prix this weekend? Can Lewis Hamilton make a dent? in this championship battle with Max Verstappen. It seems inevitable that he's going to have to if Mercedes and himself are going to claw back Red Bull and Max Verstappen. But let's wait and see what happens. If you haven't already, please consider liking the video if you've enjoyed it. And also please consider subscribing to the channel. We're chasing 500 subscribers. 412 of you that have followed us so far, thank you so much for doing so. We hope more of you can join the DNF1 family as in the future. We've got plenty of room for all of you. So please hit that subscribe button. And of course, if you are following us on your major podcast, your favorite podcasting platform i should say thank you so much for doing so but until then guys stay safe take care thank you for tuning in and we will see you in the next episode of the dnf1 f1 podcast take care see you soon all right